and we're back for another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I'm your host, Spicy Madi, and joined with me is the beautiful and lovely Scotty Jeanette Madden. And she's going to be joining in on the conversation today, which is a little controversial. Why sexual and gender labels suck, okay? So uh, let me give you a little bit of background on her. Her bio is fabulous. And like every single guest on The Spicy Life, it's lengthy and amazing. (laughs) Scotty Jeanette Madden, with over 30 years in the television production trenches, is a top adventure survival show runner, lead productions into the world's most dangerous jungles, glaciers, and deserts, while engaged in a lifelong battle for her soul. Dun, dun, dun. All anyone uh, knew was that Scotty, who rose from the technical ranks as a camera operator and editor, brought a frontline experience to her work as a writer, director, and showrunner to bring her crews home safely while getting all of the story. I have to meet this woman. (laughs) (laughs) She put all of this, plus a marriage of 26 years, on the line when she shook off family and society expectations, her own fears, and when she dismantled the walls of her self-imposed prison to be herself. Her work is seen on Discovery Channel, Nat Geo, Animal Planet, and she has also co-created and directed her children's TV series and feature films. She's an advocate and activist for the LGBTQIA communities. And her first book, Getting Back to Me, published in 2015, has been on Amazon LGBTQIA bestseller list for memoirs. Her second book, Reckless in the Kitchen, A Year of Light, Laughter, and Love, oh, and Food, <laughs> will be published this summer. So we're hearing it first, guys. We're getting an exclusive with her. And uh, can I tell people that you just did a TED Talk? Yes, you can. Okay, so I feel super special that she went from TED Talk to The Spicy Life. Um, I feel like that speaks volumes to uh, how amazing we are as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to I'm get totally, you next. That's right. yeah, so. <laughs> but we always warm up our guests with The Naked Truth, where this is where you're going to have to open up to us. You're going to let us know, you know, the, the, your inner deepest thoughts and secrets. And so SPICY stands for self, passion, intimacy, communication, and learning to say yes. You don't have to memorize that right now. But the first question is S. When did you first fall in love with self? Wow, that's a great question. I haven't really thought of it in that direction. Um, with self, it, that's very layered. I, uh, and that's a lot of what um, I'm here to talk about today and what I write about in my book. And um, But I think when I first fell in love with self was when I saw myself reflected in Marcy's eyes. Mm. And Marcy is your wife. Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to get into uh, Marcy as well and your experience and um, love of her. But uh, I think that's a great response. We're going to ask you now, how old were you when you discovered your life passion? Well, I would say I have two life passions. One okay. was being in love with Marcy, for sure. Oh, my gosh. Um, uh, I, and I literally, I prayed for her for three years solid at 3 o'clock in the morning. Every morning, I hit God up and said, make this shit happen. Wait, you prayed for your wife? I prayed for her to come. To f- come into your to life. Come into my life. What is this prayer? Because all of my single audience want to know what prayer brings them love. Uh, I said, um, please send me someone who will love me as much as I can love them. Mm. Uh, and my other passion is telling stories. And I, I I don't remember not telling stories. So I, I'm i not exactly sure what age that was. I just always did it. So you've been telling stories since you were like in kindergarten? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, before that. Uh, okay, what is your biggest turn on? This is for I, intimacy. Ooh, my biggest turn on. Come on, tell us the little kinky little secrets. Everybody's got them. Whips and chains. Toes in the armpit. <laughs> Let me know the fetish. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I would have to say... Um, I think it's that area right between my... When someone runs their fingernail down that... Ooh, between the, will, between the tatas. Yeah. It'll, okay. It'll, it'll, it'll light me up, <laughs> and I have no brain after that. <laughs> Wait, so it's like this little... It's like a yeah. run of... Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell my husband to do that to me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best compliment you've ever received? Uh, well, I made these candies, and uh, I gave them to the woman that hired me to do the show I did on Discovery called Dude, You're Screwed. And I gave her, I gave everybody in the office two, and um, I didn't know if she'd gotten hers yet. And I saw her later on that day, and I just wanted to make sure she got them. Wasn't right. fishing for compliments. And I said, uh, 
hey, Pam, did you get the chocolates? She goes, oh, yeah, I, those were amazing. You know, you gave me two, and I thought, well, I'll bring one home to my husband, and then I thought, fuck him. <laughs> so that was a pretty good compliment. <laughs> that is a pretty good compliment. <laughs> they didn't make them home. Okay, you made us these special treats. Do tell about this chocolate, because you told me that it was spicy, too. There's some That's habanero right, there in there. Yeah, uh, so these are in my new cookbook that's coming out, um, and I call these cranberry gems. I usually make them at Christmas, and I'm kind of proud of them. I invented them. I take um, slivered almonds and I toast them and then I dust them with habanero salt. Um, <sighs> the cranberries have been sauteing in Cabernet with a little bit of chipotle. Oh my God. And then, what? Um, and then the white chocolate uh, kind of keeps it all together so you can get that all into your mouth in one fell swoop. Okay, you're a woman after my own heart um, and my taste buds. <laughs> they may not make any home either to my husband. <laughs> Fuck him. <laughs> Fuck him. I'm going to have to do that after I don't bring him anything home. He's gonna, I'm going to owe him. Okay, and then this one is the why. This is the yes. This is what is your biggest fear? Mediocrity. Yeah, I'm, I, I just... You know, I always, I'm always been reaching for the stars, no matter what I mm -hmm. do. And, um, and no, let me take that back. Uh, mediocrity, I'll take as long as I don't hurt the people that are with me along the way. Okay. You know, I've had to do so much um, collaborative television, and it's usually in like really dangerous places. And just coming home with uh, a show where you know people got hurt physically, or mentally, or emotionally. That's not worth it to me. It, it shows up on the screen. Yeah. So I just I fear that I'm not able to be in all places at once to kind of make sure that doesn't happen. So you have this like innate desire to protect. Protect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's strength. That's that shows the strength in you. And so I brought you on because I started hearing your story, your testimony. Um, uh, Scotty Jeanette lives in my neighborhood and I'm walking one day and uh, who was I with? Um, Ruthie. Ruthie. And I, you know, I ran into you while you were hiking as well. And you started sharing your story. You had your TED talk shirt on and I'm like, oh my God, you did TED talk. That's goals. I'm going to be applying. <laughs> and so <laughs> you started sharing your story and it was so moving that I knew I had to bring you on the show because I had much like many people, a million questions about your experience, about your decision-making process, about the transgender community. And it was almost as if, okay, I'm gonna step on some toes or I'm gonna be, um, you know, I don't know, insensitive. If I, you know, ask these questions, a better platform is if me, much, much like, you know, majority of the community are unaware or, um, we, you know, we don't have knowledge of this, why are we ignorant about this? Why not educate us, educate ourselves so that we can be empowered with the information and be more sensitive and collaborative? So I want to share some stats with you and tell me, because I did some research before the show, I wanted to understand too, not just what I could ask and what would you know potentially be insensitive or not, but more about the community itself, the transgender community. And it is a uh, gay pride month. Yes. And so um, you are a huge advocate within the LBGTQIA community. Did I get that? And add the plus in there. Add the plus. Yeah, oh, oh, what is the plus so for? So See, many, I didn't even know that. So what is, did you know the plus? We, just put a, we put a plus in there and just say and. And everything and else. Everything. Okay. <laughs> so the plus <laughs> is like in the continuation. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So um, what exactly do you do within the community? Oh, um, How do you advocate? Uh, two ways, um, you know, first of all, we have a phrase that's called just visibility, mm -hmm. you know, showing up and, and being out and loud and proud um, and doing our own lives helps the world see, oh, and she doesn't have two heads. Yeah. You know, um, so that's number one. But and I also I speak a lot for universities and corporations, um, you know, the old fashioned term was sensitivity training, but really it's a way of helping people to understand, particularly in the medical community. I've done you know, probably over 60 workshops just for Kaiser hospitals alone. Oh my gosh. Um, they are really committed to it, you know? And so we show up and we help people understand, like as a doctor, you can't have any barriers, Yeah. you know, uh, or, because you're going to have your hands inside my body. Right. So you got to get it right. And it's a, it's the, there's a real trust issue that you have to have. And, you know, we're, we're an embattled community. I mean, we, there's, there's no two ways about that. And so it's, 
the best way, I think, is to help people understand. And it's glorious when somebody asks us a question that you know wants truly wants to know. Yeah, so educate me. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm serious. I, I'm gonna, I want to share some of this information because I was shocked to find some of this out. Um, I did some digging on um, glad.org mm -hmm. and some of the information came up was incredible. 29% of transgender people live in poverty uh, compared to 14% of the general population, 30% uh, report being homeless at some point in their lives. Uh, transgender people experience unemployment three times the rate of the general population. I, I'm blown away by some 30% of uh, transgender people report being fired, denied a promotion or experiencing mistreatment in the workplace due to their gender identity. 31% of transgender people experienced mistreatment in the past year in a public um, place or accommodation. They were denied equal service. 24% uh, were verbally harassed. 2% were physically attacked. 40% reported attempting suicide during their lifetime. 40%. And that's nearly nine times the attempted suicide rate in the United States of 4.6%. Mm -hmm. I was floored. Because I, you know, I'm over here thinking that, uh, you know, based I'm, I'm black and Mexican, I'm a woman, and I'm already, you know, feeling as if I'm a community that, you know, we, we're already mistreated, we're already misunderstood, you know, I'm fighting for my rights. Meanwhile, you're fighting for your rights as well. Mm -hmm. What made you more passionate about this? Was it just your personal experience? Or was it something that you were experiencing a while, you know, prior before until you realized that this was something, a community that you were going to join? That's a good question. I mean, you know, I came out late. I came out at the age of 48. Um, I came out with, you know, as you read in my list, all that stuff was on the line. You know, I had the dream marriage and the most amazing woman on the planet, present company accepted. Uh, <laughs> thank <laughs> but, you, thank you. You know, said, said I do. And we had a fantastic, amazing, wonderful marriage. I didn't want to break any of that. And yet people think a lot of, wrong things about the experience being transgender and one of them is that we have a choice right mm -hmm. like well some people said to me you had it good why didn't you just like keep it on the red you yeah. know and keep going i didn't have that choice you know my body actually full-on outed me to my wife one morning I, against my will it just went yeah. wait you know? what do you mean like can you share with me that entire experience you've been married for 29 years before you decided to tell her or 20 years, yeah. 20 years, okay. You, this is at this point, and always correct me if I misspeak, mm -hmm. you identified as a man at that point. I never identified as you a man. You never identified never as a man. Identified as a man. Well, even when you married her, you were still identifying yourself as a woman? Yes, but I didn't tell anybody that out loud, right? Because I was uh, at the age of four. Okay. Well, this is the, the subject of my TED talk. Give us the whole, <laughs> give, it, give it all, give us all the juice. Okay, so can we back up just, just a slight Start from discussion. the beginning. You came out the yeah. womb and then what? Yeah, well... I want to say this. Um, everything that I'm going to tell you is my experience alone. Okay. Okay. I don't speak on behalf of the transgender community because that would be like saying that you speak on behalf of the spicy Latinas and the black. <laughs> the Afro-Latinas. Like, yes. Right? I get yeah, it. I get you know, it. There's, so we're not one size fits all. And, you know, I love you. Understandable. You can, you can ask me anything. Yeah. Okay. But uh, there are things that you don't say out loud in public to another trans person for a zillion reasons, mm -hmm. which we'll get into. Part of it is just actual full-blown safety and physical violence. Mm. You know, you may think that you're woke, but the dude next to you at the bar thinks right. that I should be dragged behind a car. And oh that my happens. gosh! Yeah, you know, we have, you know, particularly trans women of color are that's open season on them. Yes, you know, it's I like, did read that. I don't know why anybody thinks that. There seems to be this innate piece of human nature that wants to have some place mm -hmm. where they can be evil. Yeah. And we're the ones that got picked. You know, over there, it's cool. Nobody cares about them. You can do what you want, you know? And that's, it's, uh, every minority has had this along the way. Mm -hmm. And it's, I guess, our number's up. Our number has always been up, though, yeah. by the way. It's, we didn't just like arrive on a big airplane last year. With liver and cock. But why does it feel like that, though? Because we're well, starting to see it now more in the media. What is it? Why do you think that there's so much attention now around the transgender community? Well, part of it is that there, we've had some just, you know, amazingly strong trans women and trans men who have stepped forward and said enough. Mm -hmm. And they've said enough in various different ways. Laverne and Cox says enough with a microphone oh my in gosh, her I hand and she struts Cox, across yeah. the stage and, you know, is as fabulous as anybody could ever hope to be. 
um, Alexandra Billings has gotten down into the deepness of it in, mm -hmm. in acting. There's trans actors and actresses across the board. We've got stand-up comics, we've got music, you know. So people have stepped forward and said, okay, in the past I wouldn't have told you I was trans because you would hit me. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I can't live anymore with what's happening, so I'm gonna step forward and say, I'm one, right? So I think that's why it's coming out uh, a lot. That's why it's a part of the conversation. But we live in a bubble here in Los Angeles. We are so, you know, it's, if you go like east of I-5, sometimes it's not good. So by bubble, you mean, because I feel like Los Angeles is diverse, but we're segmented. Does we're that make sense? But yeah, but we all, have, we all know to be cool around each other yeah. and, and allow for everyone to be who they are, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, you know, you go outside of uh, east of the, the five and, <laughs> and, you know, it's open season. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all bets are off. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, I got diverted you're, a little bit, but, but you asked me a question. You're going to tell us the story yes. of your discovery and then how you presented that to your wife. Okay, so the discovery was that I dis was actually told and abused when I presented any kind of feminine behavior from the time of the age of four by someone who wasn't even in my family, threatening that what they would that the problem was that it would upset my father if he knew that I was his daughter. So I didn't even have that language. I didn't have son or daughter. I was, you know, my youngest next sibling, Kimberly, my dear sister, is three years younger than me. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm five years old, four years old, five years old. She's over there. Yeah. We don't have pink and blue and all that kind of stuff per se. It's just you're a kid. Right. You're just you're who you are. But anytime I did anything that looked feminine, uh, it was beaten out of me. So I knew not to do that. It I was knew, beaten out of you by the friend of the family. Yeah. Okay. So I knew, do not do this. And that's what my whole life was. Is don't tell anybody this is really what's going on. And you're getting pushed further and further down the boy track. And, you know, after a while, you're like, well, I, I, I do like sports. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's not, girls play sports too, but but I'm going here and this is what I need to do, what I need to do to get better at it. Um, and as you start getting better at it, then you start to learn the rest of the nuances around it. And then you start to also realize from the perspective of, well, if they knew that I was a girl, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be on this football team anymore. I know how they, what they think of girls. Yeah. You know, if they, if they knew that I was a girl, I wouldn't get any dates, you know? I mean, I like her. I want to go out with her, but if I was a girl who wanted to like her in, you know, when I went to high school, mm -hmm. we were still on slate chalk and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, can, so you, you, I guess my point is you get to know what, what's expected, what's yeah. necessary, what's going to be okay. So you're behaving based on expectation exactly. to perform so that that way you can still have acceptance. And go forward in your life. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's like you, you still have a to-do list. You still have things you need to do in life. And you know that if I want to get from here to there, i got to do this. You know, I just had to do it with this tamping down what became gender dysphoria. Mm. I don't think I would, you know, a trans person's not going to necessarily have trans, uh, gender dysphoria, which is... Expr dis explain what that is to okay. us, gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is the trauma and coping mechanisms designed to deal with that trauma mm -hmm. that comes from not being able to live in your true gender, okay? So the more that you tamp that down, the bigger a problem you create. Mm. So it creates this, it's the opposite of euphoria. Yeah. If euphoria is the absolute pinnacle of human feeling, dysphoria is the opposite. That's why 41% suicide yeah. rate, right? Um, so for me, the only way I could deal with that was to completely disassociate even what it was from. Like, I knew it was because I was trying to pretend to be a boy. Um, but even I had to separate what the was, because if I, if you have something like that going on with you and you don't address it, then you know you're crazy. Mm -hmm. right? So you know you're not addressing it. You know you should be and you're not. And that just creates a, a snake eating its own tail. It feels like you're living with a secret. It's even more than that. I mean, like, for me, it started to manifest in really intense physical feelings. Um, it was, I could feel it. I called it the hijacker. I could feel it coming. I knew it was about time. It wasn't until I wrote my book that I 
that I realized it was happening once a month. What is this once a month feeling? Describe it. <laughs> okay, so it was, um, it started with a sense of impending like doom and destruction. Okay, like, oh, oh shit, something bad is really going to come and happen. I've known this feeling before. Here it comes, and it would light up my body, and I would be like white hot pins and needles for like two weeks. Like this was the, and that's the minor part of it. Uh -huh. The rest was this incredible containment of, of anxiety, and and that manifested in real like a vibration of energy that would last for three to four days, where I really felt like you could see it on me if you looked at me. Nobody could, mm -hmm. but. It really felt like my body was going to vibrate apart, like just fly apart into yeah. a million different pieces. Coupled with that was this intense, I need to be myself, I need to be feminine, and this other voice that said, and you will never be that. Mm. So this war was going on inside of me this entire time. And, you know, the intelligence would be, yeah, you can't do that. How are you going to do that? You don't have the parts. You know, let's just be real because it's not about getting dressed. It's about like being yeah. me, you know, it's like, so how can I rectify this? Even my own body is lying to me. It's not me. And are you experiencing anger with yourself for not having the parts, for not having the organs? Yeah, you know, uh, most of the anger and shame that I had was that I was allowing myself to feel this bad. Okay. And that's, I thought, like I, could, I thought that I could will myself out of this feeling this bad, that I could solve it just by like either containing it or ignoring it or talking myself through it yeah. none of that stuff worked because it was a real phys it manifested in physical pain and trauma so once i started to have to deal with that knowing it was going to come again some other time i would have to start really disassociating it and make that just completely abstract thoughts it was abstract feeling it was abstract pain it was you know it was like phantom arm don't go why you had an arm there or lost the arm or what you would mm -hmm. do with the arm if you had it. Just for, wall off the pain. And that's what happened. So I started walling it off and walling it off and walling it off. And, and it would come. It would come once a month throughout my entire life. So at what point do you decide I'm going to own my gender? I'm going to identify with the true gender that I am. I'm going to either make this transition or accept myself? It was about five years after I came out to Marcy. So one morning, after two weeks solid of this pain and destruction that I was just describing yeah, to you. Yeah, this sounds it, horrible. It didn't I'm go so away sorry that you experienced days. this. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it, it didn't go away after three days this one time. It's, it, was going, it was still going on at two weeks, and I was really starting to panic. Like, it's not going away this time. All the things that I do and, and, are, and can do, None of my coping mechanisms work. I got, you know, I smoked a lot of pot in high school. You know? <laughs> Who did? You, you medicated. Um, <laughs> it may have helped a little. It, that made it worse. Oh, so, it made it worse because oh you God, got no. more oh, introspective. Yeah. 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 So nothing, you, I could, you can't pray it away. You can't drug it away. You can't wish it away. You can't do anything about yeah. it. Right. So it, and it would not, I, so I was in that state for two weeks. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping, and now I'm hiding that I'm not eating or sleeping mm -hmm. from my wife, who I'm in bed with, you know? And she's like, you know, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm not fine. I'm, you know. But your wife has no clue about this. None whatsoever. She believes, so t tell me about the union, though, because she believes that she married a man. Like, at the time that she fell in love with you, she fell in love with a man. Or she, because she didn't know that you were really a woman. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So let's, we'll come back to that. Okay. That's a good point. But that's what she thought. And, and I, that was because I was really good at hiding it from everybody. So at the end of this two weeks, I was literally on the verge of a psychotic break. Mm -hmm. I, was, I found myself standing at the foot of our bed at five in the morning with two cups of coffee. And she said, and normally that's a normal Saturday morning. We get up and make coffee. We have coffee, coffee in bed, every right? morning. Right? <laughs> Didn't you say this right? is like the cup of coffee that you drink yes, like this big? Uh, yeah, <laughs> three of those. Um, and she said, that's lovely, but it's awful early. And I said, I looked at my, you know, I don't even remember how I got here. I don't remember making the coffee. And out of my mouth came all of this pain and confusion. 45 years of this and I mean, I, I started with, 
I don't know who I am. Mm. And I ended with, I do know I'm a woman. And she thought when I first started talking that I was going to ask her for a Porsche. She thought midlife crisis. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, she's like, I would have given you the Porsche. Right. <laughs> yeah. But what it was, was I, you know, my, so something that was not my plan. So when people say like, when did you make that decision? Yeah. I did not make that decision. If you weren't prepping my for body, it. My body, my subconscious made that decision for me. Once it was out, it still took us five years to figure out what that meant. You know, she would ask me like, check in like how are you doing with all that I'm like I'm good you know I'm trying to keep it now I knew it was now it was coming but I didn't know what to do about it because how do you take a, a 25 year career in television yeah. and set fire to it you know we have a mortgage we have love we have all this other stuff but why is it setting fire to it you don't think that you would have been able to stay in the industry or continue producing or directing or what like right. okay so that's a great question because that for any trans person who is you know, in the closet and is on that, that brink, our fear is the fear of the unknown, mm -hmm. right? The pain that we are suffering, we know. <laughs> we don't know that we're, what's going to happen. We don't know who's going to come with us. Mm -hmm. And there are not a lot of good stories out there yeah. of people who've made this transition and their family is all, oh my God, that's amazing. How good for right. you. And they hold you a coming out party, you know? No. In my case, they did, but oh. you don't know what's going to happen, right? You have no idea it's going to happen, and you feel like, and it is really about your identity. For me, it was like, I kept always seeing my mom's face. Mm. Like, how am I going to make her proud yeah. that I'm her daughter? You're afraid of shaming them. Yeah, and and and, and by, that, by that, by not being a good woman, you know? Ah. Like, like uh, she was the most amazing woman, first amazing woman in my life yeah. right and so like I needed to make her proud by who I could be and I didn't know how to be that mm -hmm. and I didn't know how to be that in all the roles that I had built around me because I had built a facade called Scott yeah I mean I made him the ultimate dude he was leading green berets and navy seals into the jungle and and bringing back a tv show so I didn't even have to go to boot camp you know I yeah. just had to sit back and like <laughs> you know collect accolades right, right. <laughs> they did all the work right so I like how do you disrupt the apple cart really mm -hmm. is ultimately is what the fear is and so um and it got disrupted i mean it really did i went for three years unemployed okay after i, after I really came you out. come to your wife and you have this word vomit that you couldn't control and you're telling her her reaction is i thought you were gonna ask for a porsche right. But she accepts you because Dude. it sounds like you did not <laughs> divorce. It sounds like she stayed by your side. And I think most people's fear is that they would be left and abandoned. Yes. And, and that happens. Uh, only 20% of transgender marriages survive. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So uh, and we were I mean, we went to couples therapy. We you know, we went we, we got into it to like figure it out. I went to a gender therapist to kind of, you know, figure a lot, all the rest of the mechanics of the stuff out, mm -hmm. you know, and even so. I hadn't come out to the rest of the world. So we, for five years, we kind of dealt with it. Like, what does this mean to us? And what we had to do was, and that's why I love the title of your show today, <laughs> we had to get into, like, what are gender roles and why do we believe them? Yeah. Everybody else will we'll solve the world later, but let's just talk about you and me. Why do we believe that these are our roles? Because we didn't have a, a traditional marriage in that um, she did all the housework like a, my mom mm -hmm. and I went to work and did all the work and you know did all the work. We both had always had two careers. We had our own production company together. Every time she wanted to clean the house, I would get upset because we got to go to work and I didn't marry you to be a housewife, right. like to clean the house. She wants me to pick up my clothes. That's, we all do, right? Again, <laughs> we, I, we, I, hell, I don't throw. We could train anymore. our partners. Trust me. Give, give them estrogen. You know, it works. Like I don't throw that shit on the floor anymore. I gotta wear that tomorrow. <laughs> but we never. So we never had that kind of stuff. But we still had ingrained in us. Yeah. What gender roles were in a cisgender heterosexual relationship? We had to undo that. We had to go back into it. Like, why do I believe this? Yeah. Why, why do I, who taught me that? Why did I buy it? Because it sounds like within you discovering self, she too had to reevaluate her Completely. self and her role that she oh. plays in the relationship as and well. She writes it in her book. <laughs> <laughs> and then comes the book, yes. <laughs> Shameless. I'm sorry. It's LA. Um, yeah. So that, I mean, it really was like we had to kind of go in there. We, in, in some respects, I, you know, we use the phrase when we we're talking, 
we would do workshops together. Um, we would say women to our neutral corners, but that's not necessarily true because we were always together except when I was on the road. When I was on the road for Dude, I was gone 215 days out of one year. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a lot. It's, yeah, it's on, you know, we're shooting on mountaintops in you know, countries that most people can't pronounce. So that's where that, that did that. So, but in that time apart, we had a chance to really kind of dig in. When I came home from doing the second season of Dude, I realized and I had been contemplating all along that when I first came out to her, mm -hmm. I had vomited 45 years of pain and confusion at her feet. Of course, she didn't know what to do. And of course, she wanted to solve that yeah. for me. She didn't want me to be in pain anymore. So she thought that we could just, she, you know, sent me to a homeopathy, a homeopathist to, to give me a cure for transgenderism. Tra Actually, it was for that transsexualism. Exists? No, it doesn't. I'm like, <laughs> you know, it did, it, he, the, I've never he, even heard of that. It, the, 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 do you know anything about homeopathy? No. What is homeopathy? Homeopathy is always like the essence of something. Okay. And sometimes the on the physical world, it's super powerful. You know, you can give sulfur to, um, you know, cure hives. It'll push the stuff out of your body. It's pretty powerful stuff. But when it gets into the emotional, which it can, some people get really relief out of the emotional or intellectual problems. Um, it gets more and more esoteric. So the cure for transsexualism mm -hmm. was stardust. And I'm like, well, hello. <laughs> Might as well said unicorn farts, you know. <laughs> oh, that's going to cure me. Right. right. What it did is it, it helped me. No. Uh, it, but my point is, is that she tried to have me cured because she thought that's what was necessary. She mm -hmm. thought I was having a midlife crisis. Um, I just had low testosterone levels. She didn't know how low. No. Um, you know, that kind of thing. She's trying to work with you, though. It sounds like she's she trying was. to find a solution. Because she loves me. Yeah. Right. She doesn't want you to be in pain. Exactly. But does it also, did she at any point question what she did wrong? Was, it, was there this like, Always. oh, you're not attracted to me anymore? Did I do this to you? Like, I'm yeah. sure, because sometimes when our partner is hurting, we start to blame self. Uh, yes. And that's exactly what she did. And that was the turning point for us. Because when I was able to finally say to her, this is not about you. Mm -hmm. So... And this is not about us mm -hmm. as much as it is about us, but it really is about me. And what I meant by that was uh, the part about it, not about being about us, was that everything in our world was perfect except for my dysphoria. Mm. And there was a cure for that. There was an easy cure for that. When she, when she like many women especially, men, I don't, have any experience with but women in the transgender community the allies the mm -hmm. spouses what happens to them is that they confuse having never confronted this yeah gender identity and sexuality and those are two separate things this is your time yeah. to tell us the difference okay so gender identity is who you go to bed as okay G sexuality is who you go to bed with i go to bed as a woman yes I'm attracted to Marcy. Does Marcy's sexuality, though, change when you decide that you are, or what you, when you come to grips with the fact that you're a woman? Does Marcy now become a lesbian? Here's where labels suck. Yes. Yes. So what I used to, and, and I would be the first one to say, I am a gold star lesbian. <laughs> I am. And beautiful. I am rare as yes. They come, right? <laughs> um, and she would say, please don't say that because then they think I'm a lesbian. And she doesn't, it, we have, you know, our world is as diverse mm -hmm. as, I mean, our family world is as diverse. So she was honoring the gay women in our world because she wasn't them and they were them. And they identify as lesbians and she didn't. Now, identifying as a lesbian and being with a woman are two different things. A lesbian is probably going to have, if the first partner that you're talking about mm -hmm. is not in the picture, the next partner is probably going to be a woman. That's what being a lesbian on the basis of it means. Okay. When you identify as a lesbian, well, now you're buying into like lesbian culture, lesbian mores, lesbian social uh, circles, mm -hmm. right? Or you just feel like saying to the world in a definitive point, this is me. Yeah. Right? In this label. And 
I, there's, you know, that's why we have the L in the LGBTQIA+, right? For um, lesbians. For lesbians who, uh, I am a lesbian. That's not necessarily for a woman who just wants to and is attracted to and will probably have a relationship with another woman. So there's two different things. Mm -hmm. Now, the assumption in our world is that if you're a woman, you're going to be with a man. And if you're a man, you're going to be with a woman. So if somebody says to you, I'm going to be with a woman, and you're a woman, and you're this person you've been married to all this time, yeah. then you think, oh, you're leaving me. And yes. that's what Marcy was worried about. And when I said, I am not leaving you. Okay. Her so, fear was being left. Yeah. Like I would, that I would leave her. Was your fear that she would leave you? You know, she... You knew she was ride or die. You were like, Marcy's not going anywhere, even if I tell her this. I did. Really? Yeah, that I is some that, serious but I, but, but confidence right there heart. in your relationship. That is some... What did she do to make you feel so secure in your love? We just had it. Wow. Yeah. People die for that. I know. Like, I, that is incredible. Yeah. I, 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 this, it's not the first time I've had to contemplate. It, I probably should reverse engineer it and hit this to help people, but all I can tell you- Yeah, give you me that love potion. <laughs> what is that? Because I'm coaching people all the time on relationships. And so if if we could just guarantee the security, you know, and, and I always ask our guests on the show, you know, what's important, more important to you, security or passion? Some people choose passion, some people choose security. You know, they want to know that their partner will never leave them. They're like, I'll sacrifice the, you know, fire and desire for the security, for knowing that I have my solid rock by my side. I don't know why you'd have to pick between the two, but it's, okay, it's a hypothetical. It's a hypothetical. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, we want yeah. both. We yeah. aim for both, yeah, yeah. but well, it lets you know what you prioritize. Okay, and this is going to sound strange having me just describe to you that I was, you know, basically in the closet for 45 years. I gave everything I had to Marcy. Now, here's something that a transgender person knows from experience that a cisgender person might not know. And cisgender is, because not everybody you. knows what that if is. You, if a cisgender person is a person who identifies with the ways in which they have their biological bodies say they are. Okay. So a person who is, uh, as my friend Josh would say, a girl person who identifies as a girl person is a cisgender person. Okay. Okay. So go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted making oh, you explain. Yeah, um, <laughs> a, I think what I was going to say was how I knew that I could have this intense, horrifying tsunami of pain called gender dysphoria and still thrive in the world and still be a loving person is because a human experience is a 360 degree experience. Mm -hmm. But some people don't understand that. And trans people have had to live that. That's why we understand it. So, you know, Marcy kept saying to me, well, if you've been in this much pain, how come I didn't know about it? Yeah. How come you're not a drug addict, alcoholic, you know, derelict? How do you, how come you're not in a hospital bed? How could it be as bad as you say and you and you seem to be the happiest person on the planet? And it's because you learn to compartmentalize it. Mm -hmm. You learn to stick it in little boxes and every once in a while that box will slide across the ship's deck and slam your leg and you have to deal with it, but Otherwise, you go and batten down the hatches again and keep sailing. Yeah. You know, so that's that's what we know. The other part of it is that I could tell you everything about me. Mm -hmm. You're going to remember 10 percent of it inside of an hour after me telling you. Yeah. Right. So I can. There's so much to share in a loving relationship with Marcy. I shared everything else except that. Right. Which is a pretty big freaking deal it is a big freaking yeah. deal it is i thought i was going to take it to my grave though i wasn't like i was living a secret life like i was sneaking out at night and and going off and and being unfaithful know, unfaithful yeah. for sure um or or even just like you know being living this a alternate woman. yeah right that's not what it was so that's why it wasn't necessarily sharing you know if if 
I thought it was going to go to my dream, my grave. So, so why would I say it out loud? And transgender don't appreciate being identified as drag. Is that correct? It's a difference. Some people mistake the two. Well, again, back to labels. There are some that do. <laughs> <laughs> you're educating us. Come on, right. you're educating us. So, so if if we're going to make it black and white, and we and we're going to play it like trading cards, mm-hmm. a drag queen or drag king typically, typically, clichedly, traditionally have been gay men. Okay. Okay. Or gay women in drag king. Yeah. However, drag was some places in some courts around the world, especially in, you know, the America in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, was the only place where transgender people could be accepted. Right. Yeah. So we have a, we're like, we're like siblings, right? Mm -hmm. We're at opposite ends sometimes of a political or emotional spectrum because you know I'm real and they're like honey I'm not real I am so not real mm-hmm. my eyebrows go up to here you know um, but we're fighting for the same things and we're we're we are we're siblings for sure um, you know we have different mothers maybe <laughs> <laughs> um, so and and there's some very famous uh, you know advocates for the trans community that did uh, had great careers in drag so we've always kind of coexisted together partly it's because we were accepted in, in those areas. So that's, that's, so it's not offensive, but it would, you know, when someone is, especially when you're trying to climb over this chasm of mm-hmm. a body that's been sculpted by testosterone, you know, and you don't have the means nor the desire to go under the knife for anything on your face or your body. I mean, like, please don't shoot my arms. I had to lift weights to be on my the football team in high school because I was a heavily recruited athlete on my way to a college career. Yeah. So I'm hating it now, you know. <laughs> like, Your body looks amazing, <laughs> first you. off. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to sculpt arms? Wait, let me say that again. Do that again. <laughs> but that's the thing. Is like, but for me, it's like, no, it's a symbol of my past yeah. when I had to act like a guy. But... So, Scotty Jeanette, tell me, do you feel, and and I know that you're not speaking on behalf of the entire community, do you feel as if you were born into the wrong body? And if so, why? Why are we born into the wrong body when we feel, you know, when we are transgender? Why why do we not feel like this is the body we belong in? Some Okay, so th- that's an interesting phrase. Okay, born in the wrong body. And it has some history to it. Okay, educate us. The history is that um, the the ways in which we can get our medical care and our legitimacy in the world with a birth certificate and a driver's license and a passport that I'll have. I have never worked so hard to get an F in my life. I read that it was (laughs) extremely hard from a legal standpoint when it comes to all your like In California, there's there's still a a good track. Still costs you about 800 bucks to get the first court order that sets the whole rest of the, you know, the chain in motion. Um, it's been streamlined in California. In the others, you know, in New York, it's pretty good too. But other states, it's almost impossible. Yeah. Right. And it's and it, it's a barrier, and that's another way of keeping. It's like voter registration cards for the black community yeah. in the '60s, right? Can, that was yeah. not designed for anything other than to push the black community right. out of the polls. Let's be real. That's take away our power. Yep. Yeah. Take away power. Right. <laughs> so it's the same kind of thing. When we do get that legitimacy of that card, now we've got a whole bunch of other stuff we have to do. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, it required two letters. It still requires two letters in some healthcare systems, and Kaiser's one of them. But the two letters back in the day was two psychiatrists had to back up and verify that they do believe that you are transsexual, the phrase back then we didn't okay. have transgender and that you will seriously harm yourself if you do not transition medically okay and transitioning medically me- used to mean you had to have gender at the time was mm-hmm. called sexual reassignment surgery we don't use that phrase anymore okay. we say gender confirming or gender affirming surgery 
and that is a now a big bucket because at the time it didn't even talk about trans men. Yeah, that was strictly for trans women, right? And it's like they they have the same exact issues. They wanted the, there's things about their bodies that they don't like, want to change. And okay. I read that it is insensitive for us to assume that every single transgender has gone through the surgery, it or is. to even ask and you know that we make these assumptions that we you know think that every single person went under the knife or that you got you know work done or cosmetic surgery done. That there's something very personal and private that within your community, it's, and it's not always fair that sometimes you guys are denied um, service as well. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So let me. Um, I, I realize I got diverted answering your yeah, question. Yeah, I asked so a lot of questions. Question, right. No, no, that's good. <laughs> but it, they're, they're great questions. So, anyways, the phrase "born in the wrong body" mm -hmm. was a phrase that was, you had to do that, and you had to say, "I hate my penis" or "I hate my vagina." If you said those cold words, and we all as girls and boys talk to each other, yeah, like all the girls were like, just tell them that you hate your penis, and say that what you're you need born to say, the wrong body, uh -huh. and you'll get your letters, and then you can go get your hormones. Okay, so that was a phrase that was brought in. That that's why that phrase is still off in there. And the problem with with one size fits all kind of regard of our mm -hmm. community is that there are some people that go, no, I'm cool. All I need to 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 dampen or eliminate gender dysphoria, or I don't even have gender dysphoria. There's some in, in the trans community, particularly gender nonconforming, that don't have gender dysphoria. But they all they needed in their life to live true and authentically, which is a weird word. I'm sorry I used that. We use it a lot. Yeah. It means nothing to me. But anyways, I used it just because I'm on a roll. <laughs> um, keep it going. Keep all it going. we need is for someone to say, what are your pronouns? She, her? Mm -hmm. Okay, hello, she, her. That's all some people need. And they're not even going to change their clothes. They just want to be regarded that. They just wanted to say it out loud. Some people are... Should on. we be asking that? What pronoun should we use with you? Um, you can ask. I hope I'm wearing enough eyeliner to make it <laughs> obvious. You know? But, you know, RuPaul sometimes, you know, <laughs> beats me every time. But is that like a normal question? Like when we are unsure, is it polite to ask? Or is it, will you be offended if we ask? Uh, that's controversial okay. too. Okay, I would say the answer to that question is it's case by case. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the same way that not everybody hates their bodies, not everybody believes that they were born in their own bodies uh, or in the wrong in the wrong body. I myself am a really in intelligent, too too much for my own sake, fifty something year old woman who can't say I was born in the wrong body because that doesn't make sense to me. I said it, I felt it sometimes, but truly speaking, I'm here, this is the body I have. It can't be wrong, God doesn't make mistakes. Yeah. So my journey has been to, okay, then what do I need to do in order to live a fulfilled life? And so I have had gender conforming surgery, uh, gender conforming surgery. Um, Thank you for sharing that. I know that's personal. Yeah, and I do that because you don't ask. Mm -hmm. It's not in the same way. Like you know, I've had to be pretty gross with some of my. I have a lot. I you know, obviously come from the boys' world. I have lots of boyfriends, yeah. and they're like not boyfriends, the guys, guys, the guys, yeah. And they're like, well, we could talk about anything, right? And I'm like, so have you had the surgery? I'm like, how's your dick? <laughs> Did you get it up last night? That's right. Oh, it's still on the pills? Oh, honey. You know, right? It's as invasive a question. Yeah. And that doesn't even seem to be in baseball. We call that a brushback pitch. They don't <laughs> seem to respond to that, right? It's, 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 but it is odd. Like, I, I always, women get this a little bit more when I'm able to say, have you ever, to a stranger or even to a good friend, mm -hmm. been asked about your private part? I get asked often, but in my profession, uh, because I'm constantly talking about sex, me personally, yes. Okay. But that's because I'm often asked sexual questions because I work with a lot of people who can't climax or who, you know, experience, you know, challenges in their relationship. But on a normal day-to-day -day basis, I'm not in the grocery store and people aren't asking me, you know, if I have a vagina or a penis. Like, that's not a common question that I'm but getting, they, no. We, we get asked all the time. Yeah. People feel, and they, and then when you say, that's a little, uh, you know, normally it costs you three drinks to get that answer. <laughs> and only if you're freaking So you play with it. You kind of I like, have to, yeah. yeah. Because it, I, I know what, you know, and, and, but you get the criticism. No, 
I'm just being curious. I'm like, really? But why do you think, why do you think we ask that question? Why do we want to know so that we know whether to take you more serious or not? Like, oh my gosh, you're not a real transgender unless you have, like, would you think, is that what you're thinking in your head when we ask you that? Yeah, frankly, it is. I, and I've noticed this, like what was odd when I first came out, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I have a lot of dear friends and a lot of them are women over the age of 60, right? 50s, 60s. The older women would say to me, oh, good for you. That's very courageous. Are you going to have the surgery? Mm. And it was like, and at the time, I was just brand new to even being able to walk around in the world as Scotty. Yeah. So I would say, well, who's got a hundred grand in a year of their life as a way of blowing it off? And I would Oh my watch, gosh, that's how much it cost. It can. And I would watch their shoulders Ooh. slump immediately. And they're like, oh, I don't have to take you that seriously then. This is just a cost. Got it. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. So there are no levels of transgender. There's no, there's no, you know, uh, test for it. Yeah. There's no degrees, more trans than you, less trans than you. There is, there's none of that. When we're in an advocacy place, when, especially myself, I hold space for people who are never going to alter their body in any way, shape, or form. They don't want it, don't need it. It's not going to fulfill their life. It's not important to them. And there's some people that have facial feminization surgery, and that's it for them. They don't need to change their genitals. Yeah. They're good. They're fine. I'm happy. It's all about being able to live, really, be able to walk out your own door without feeling like you want to die or going to die. Yeah. And there is a level of comfort. I mean, we, you know, it gets us now we're kind of going into the world of passing, right? Passing is very controversial because especially – and this is a great thing that the gender nonconforming community is helping us to understand is passing isn't important. Passing for a lot of transgender women, though, is. Our personal safety is at stake. Like passing as that gender that you're identifying as. Exactly. Okay. Looking like a cis girl. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's what it is. I mean, you know, if everybody goes like, you know, oh, my God, I had no idea. Mm-hmm. I'm like, idea of what? Right. <laughs> That I better at football than your boyfriend? What? What are you asking me? <laughs> you know? Um, so it, it's an odd thing. Why do people need to know that? There is a fascination. Mm-hmm. We can't deny it. There is a curiosity. Uh, we've all uh, looked at our body, our own bodies for a long time, depending upon how old we are. We've all explored different things that we've done sexually mm-hmm. and intellectually and emotionally. And when we see that somebody has done something differently, there could be a level of curiosity there. I totally get it. There is something. A little fascination. Yeah. The difference is, is that that fascination, if it turns to control, mm. which it usually does, that's why we get sensitive. And that's why we get sensitive in the trans community to even answering those questions. Mm-hmm. Right, so we're trying to educate the community. It's not about surgery because it maybe it was it was for Scotty, but it's not for any of some of my friends. But I think we do ask to that point, and when it comes, even when it comes to, I get this a lot with what ethnicity are you? I'm usually getting that question because I look a certain way, they can't tell. But once they know, then they'll know how to treat me. They want to know what box to check off for me so that they can automatically figure out. Okay, we we see you as this. We can relate to you this way, or we can, we will know your past experiences if you share this with us. So, and, and that comes from being, you know, biracial. And so they want to know so that they can identify how to treat me, I feel like. I, I think that's right. And if that's all done on a positive level. I, I don't always know be, that it is. I, I, I don't always know that well, it is. If, I mean, yeah. yeah. It's, sometimes if someone generally says, wow, you know, you look a lot like my daughter and she's biracial and you go, oh, well, I'm biracial too. They're like, oh, well, now we have a point of connection. That's a lovely connection, yeah, right? Yeah, you're trying to make if the connection. Like, oh, I had a Latina n- uh, nanny. I don't know. Uh, so are you Latina? No, I'm black. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> right? You know, it's like if it's done for control or if it's done so that I right. can suddenly, if, if it's check a box so that I know how to treat you. Right. But the treating you is with less respect. Yep and less concern and l- less humanization, then that's why it's a bad thing. Yeah. So that's why we resist it, you know. It's why we resist labels, We're, you know, in the trans community especially. Everybody wants to push everybody in. Like the gender nonconforming community is part of the trans community, and they're like, no, we're, we, 
we don't want to do what you guys are doing. Those girls and boys, they're up. They do your thing. Mm-hmm. More power to you, but we're not. It's and and they, they have every suck. right to say that. Yeah. You know? um, and some of them, like, want to be part of the trans community. So we're just like, come on in. You know, we, trans community is the biggest umbrella under there. You're going to help me answer a dear spicy question. Okay. Uh, but I have to show love to our spicy sponsor, Toyota. Toyota. Okay, and we're back. I have Scotty, Jeanette, uh, Madden in the building, you guys, and she is answering a boatload of questions for us in as regards to. <laughs> I know, in regards to the transgender community, um, I got a, a dear spicy question. You're gonna help me answer this from your perspective. Uh, I am um, gonna just go right into so. so Dear Spicy, my girls and I did a black girls brunch a few weeks ago and the subject of being bisexual and dating bisexual men came up. It got a bit heated to say the least. Most of the group was straight women and the consensus from the group was that most of us wouldn't date a bisexual man. I also am interested in dating a bisexual man though, but I felt a little off about my response. I'm an advocate of the LGBTQ rights, including political activism, donating to charities that further equally or that further equality for LGBT people and creating a safe space for my friends wherever I go. Yes, I even call out my family, including the old ones, when they make bigoted remarks in front of me. I don't think so, but I'm curious, am I a hypocrite for not being open to dating bisexual men or am I just being hypercritical about myself and is this just another preference I have in dating, like not dating a smoker? Is she being bigoted or a bigot? I think... uh... Okay, so here's another reason why labels suck. Mm-hmm. If she met a man and went, wow, and her heart was open, and she started to develop a relationship with that man, and then discovered that that man was bisexual, mm-hmm. in, and how she discovers, how he discloses that to her um, can be good, bad, or indifferent, um, that's how I would answer that question. If she says... Uh, you know, if everything was amazing and wonderful, and this happens to trans girls all the uh-huh. time, where it's w- when we share our past is up to us. Yeah. Versus it's like, no, you need to tell us right from the gate. It's like, no, you need to be a human. You so know? you don't think that you have to lead with that or be, because there's a lot of times that dating apps and websites and stuff, it's not marked that, or it's not, of course, in your bio. And people feel a certain type of way when they go on the date or they wind up being intimate and find out later. There's a lot of entitlement in people believing that they have the right to know who you are. There's nowhere else on the planet that that's acceptable. If two people are in a relationship, the two people make up the rules for their relationship and that alone. Mm-hmm. Or three. Or in the polyamorous <laughs> six. Right? Like you heard our previous episode <laughs> about right? the threesome. Right? Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, I think if you categorically say, I don't date you know, biracial, I mean, um, bisexual, bisexual men. people, yeah. then yeah, you're being a bigot, right? If you, cause you don't know, you don't know. That might be, have the you ride, ever been yeah, with the bisexual the ride of your life? Yeah. And you might fall in love with the most amazing person ever. I can't, I, I, it's hard for me to understand anybody who puts blinders on about love. And I remember dating a girl in high school who just told me about how she just loved men with a mustache. And I was like, I don't have a mustache. <laughs> so I, like seriously, we're talking. I'm right here. I can hear right. you. You know, so it's really weird that people run their hearts that way mm-hmm. because they don't. The fact that they would have a, a coffee clatch and talk about this in that safe space is ludicrous. It get involved with a person, know them as a person, mm-hmm. and then go, oh, you're bisexual. Oh, well, what does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean for you and me? Because it's going to be different each time. Right? I agree 100% with you. Can't, you. you there's, no, there's no way to be a bisexual. Uh, one point, though, about the bisexual community, and, and this is something that it's Pride right, Month, the bisexual presence in the formation of the Pride movement mm-hmm. is left out as often as the transgender. How so? Movement. Brenda Howard was one of the, she was the woman who, uh, a bisexual Mm -hmm. uh, woman in New York, was the one who organized the Christopher Street March a month after Stonewall that made us have the Christopher Street March a year later, which was the first Pride March. 
But how are bisexuals not included? Because they're left out. It, it, you know, it's like, oh no, it was the, it was the gays who got hurt that night. But, but I so me not right. um, understanding one hundred percent. Aren't they still considered gay though? Bisexuals? Yes. No, they're considered bisexual. So that is an incorrect label. They want to be considered just bisexual. Yeah, for a reason because there's a lot of inside the LGBT community, IA plus. <sighs> There is uh, sometimes there's there's a little in five intention mm -hmm. between uh, not not intention tension between the bi community and the lesbian community and the gay community because both of those communities believe that the bisexual community is either late to the party and uh -huh. they'll, they'll decide later or there there's some um, the jealousy of or them. greedy yeah <laughs> <laughs> right? I've heard greedy I'm like wait you can't choose you want both you want it all. And also that you know you're you're getting the privilege of passing as a straight oh, person, right? So you get to walk in those worlds, which is bizarre. But so in her, she wrote lukewarm, lukewarm Lucy as the name of the person Hi, who sent us this, <laughs> this letter. Um, so your advice to lukewarm Lucy would be to get to know the if a bisexual comes along, get to know them, be open to them, um, and if there's chemistry, great. Don't judge them if they do admit that they are bisexual. I hope that's true of all people. Right? It's not you, like if, I was a facilitator at the LA LGBT Center for um, a time. And what the labels that we use for ourselves are only useful inside of the LGBT community mm -hmm. for when you're dating. Because you'll say, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a lesbian top, I'm a lesbian bottom, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a femme, I'm a butch. Right? You have that kind of language because then someone who's looking to be that or the opposite of it can find it. Okay. Right? It helps them figure the out what there will be to you. You should never take it past that point. There's this perception, though, that if you want both, that the person in the relationship with you won't be enough. That you're going to have more of a wandering eye or you're going to be, if you're attracted to men and women and you're in a relationship with me, you know, now you're open to everything you can't decide or you're indecisive and now i don't have to worry about competition from one gender now i have to worry about competition from both that's a this is something that i often frequently hear I know, in these conversations like the, the, how that that's like a an entire world got created out of like <laughs> you haven't even had a drink yet <laughs> like, <laughs> and this is what people do this is why yeah. they set themselves yeah, up yeah, for yeah. failure no, the, when it comes I'll to dating you, the, the two um the two very open uh, bisexual um, both of them are women that I know, um, are, have both been in committed relationships. One of them has been in a, a marriage for 30 years. She's never stepped out of it. She's never mm. had mm -hmm. another partner at the same time. That's polyamory. Yeah. Right. Or polygamy. And that's different. Either you're, either yeah. you're someone who believes in commitment. That's one of your core values or you're not, it doesn't matter what exactly. sexual preference. Exactly. Right, so a bisexual person isn't gonna like go from one to another, mm -hmm. right? They're gonna be involved with the relationship and it just may be that the next person is, uh, you know, something that they didn't have last time. That's I love all. that you're clearing the air on all this and you, there's, so, I have highly like a million more questions, but we have to wrap the show up. And so what you're gonna do is tell us about your book in just a little bit, but I have to wrap it up with Date or Dash. Okay. So you're gonna ask these few questions, okay? And I mean, you're going to answer these few. So dinner with your past self or dinner with your future self? Which one would you do for Date or Dash? Oh, future self. <laughs> dinner past with your self, future self. Past self couldn't put on lipstick <laughs> to save her life. There's no words that you would say, like, you know, moving forward to this. or Like you wouldn't give yourself oh. any advice in the past. You chose future, but I was just curious. No, you know what? Um, one thing that was um, confusing to me when I was younger and in the throes of teenage angst, hormones, and gender dysphoria, there was a word that was always out on the horizon for me, and it was inevitable. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. Now it is. So I think my my past self had it together as much as it was messed up. Yeah. It's not like I want to go back and change time. Mm -hmm. That would be silly. But my future self, I can't wait to see what I'm going to be. Ooh, okay. Dinner with your ex-lover or dinner with the future lover? This might be a tricky one for you. 
I have, I, I'm having dinner with a lot of ex lovers, ex friends mm. uh, lately, uh, and it's like you know, sometimes it's absolutely wonderful. I went to my third, no, twenty, thirty, no, thirty fourth high school reunion. Oh my gosh! Congratulations! Last, last summer, thank you. It's an odd number because we did all four classes that were that was when I was a freshman. Um, when, and all that was was the past and, you know, having a, had a great time with some really dear friends and other people were like confused as hell. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, it's me. <laughs> yeah, so I guess I would say, uh, yeah, uh, future lover. Okay. And then last, <laughs> last one, dinner with Michael Jackson or dinner with your great, great grandfather? Dinner with my great great grandfather. Everybody chooses that. I'm choosing Michael. Um, <laughs> I don't think he eats. <laughs> <laughs> That's cold. That is so cold. Nah, you know, like I want some good food. Come on, Michael. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, I feel like you provided um, just some, gosh, invaluable information today. You really taught and educated us on a lot of things. I'm sure we have a ton more questions. Tell us about the book, um, your first one and your second, where we can find it. Um, shout out your wife's book as well. Please, by all means. Okay. Well, I have to show you the cover because um, we're pretty proud of that. One continuous image. And this is your wife on the left. Yeah, this is okay. Marcy. Hi, Marcy. <laughs> so... Um, this book came out in 2015. Marcy's came out in 2017. Um, you know, we talk about both sides of that story. So yeah. if anybody wants to get a complete picture of like, how, how could this be? Um, then that's one a, is about your experience. Out. The other one is from Marcy's eyes, Marcy's eyes of, of, of her experience. I mean, yeah. what happens, the other thing is, is that you don't transition alone. Anybody who thinks you transition alone is not paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> the whole family Confused. transitions with you. All your friends transition with you. You 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 go back and you discover that I call it the guitar string. There's a there's a guitar string that stretches from my heart to yours. Mm -hmm. And when you come out, you, it gets twanged and sometimes it was so hard that it loses its tuning. So it's up to me to tune mine and you to tune yours. Yeah. And then our relationship can continue on. Now, you know, a lot of people are far more open with me because they I have shared the deepest thing with them and they feel compelled in a nice way, to do the same. And so I've had some of my relationships, like it's like that um, game where you knock out the little ice you know, uh, blocks, and suddenly the whole floor drops out, and we've dropped down to a level of like depth. Jenga? It's, uh, no, like it's, it's like Jenga? Is it like another version of Jenga? Oh, something. break the yeah. ice, OK. <laughs> yeah. um, anyways, we've gotten so deep. Some of my relationships now are, are so incredibly deep. It's insane. It's almost overwhelming how beautiful and, and deep it is. Others fall away. And then you have a third book coming out. Yes, thanks for asking. So uh, my book is going to drop in July. It's um, it's one thing I learned while I was writing Getting Back to Me is that I had always worked through my gender dysphoria in the kitchen. I've been a passionate cook my you entire gotta life. Got to have some hobbies, yeah. Right? Um, and uh, it, it went beyond uh, hobby. It went to, like, you know, just my way of life. I do all the cooking for Mars. Right. So, um, but I didn't put any of the recipes in. I talked a lot about it in getting back to me, but I didn't put anything in. So this time I, I and I got a lot of feedback from my readers going, Hey, well, that's awesome. We want to know. Oh, I'm going to devour these know. chocolates later. <laughs> yeah. So I took a, it's, it's, it's called reckless in the kitchen, a year of light, laughter, love, oh, and food. And what I do is it, it starts in October and it goes all the way through the holidays and all through a year in our kitchen. And it has the dinner party or, you know, party that is associated with the holiday of that month and all the recipes that follow. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. Let everybody know where to find you. Where can they buy the books? Uh, where can they um, catch all of your, you know, videos, your TED talk eventually, like let everybody know where they can reach you. Okay. You can reach me at zuzubean.com, which is uh, our website for Zuzubean Press. Um, the books are available on Amazon. Uh, so getting back to me is available in both uh, print, Kindle and audiobook. And Marcy's book, uh, Just Because My Husband's a Woman, dot, 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 Marcy's side of the story, is available on Amazon as well. 
And you guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my Instagram at Spicy Madi. And you can go to thespicylife.com. Make sure that you download, subscribe this episode and share with a lover or a friend. And there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The Spicy Life.